after the death of Leonid Brezhnev in the fall of 1982 and then his successors Yuri Andropov and Konstantin Chernenko, the power in the Soviet Union was headed by a young and energetic Mikhail Gorbachev. He inherited a country that was in a deep economic crisis caused by ineffective methods of the so-called socialist economy. The sharp drop in prices of oil and gas on world markets, Soviet aggression in Afghanistan and a grueling arms race with the US. All these factors sharply reduced the standard of living of Soviet people every year and generated social and political problems. Under these conditions, Gorbachev announced a bold and unprecedented course of change he called Perestroika or Reconstruction, the goal of which was to renew all sectors of social and economic life in the country. After Gorbachev came to power, needed to strengthen the competitiveness of the Soviet Union on the global market. First of all, this pertained to the economy. He saw the economic collapse, its perspective and the fact that the Soviet system was ineffective, inefficient and simply not viable. In order to modernize the system, Gorbachev actually tried to implement this perestroika movement in a Chinese way. That is, first of all, he proposed several rudimentary economic improvements, namely the creation of cooperatives based on so-called self-financing of enterprises with the aim of breathing new life into the decaying Soviet system. Conceived to restore people's confidence in the power of communism, perestroika and glasnost or openness led to consequences that Gorbachev had neither foreseen nor expected. Gorbachev's reforms created opportunities for political mobilization from below. In Ukraine, the first ones to take advantage of the new political and social climate were the dissidents of the 1960s and 1970s, who returned after spending time in Soviet hard labor camps and prisons. The dissidents who returned to Ukraine came with those offenses that they were subjected to in the Brezhnev era. So they looked with high hopes at the newly declared perestroika. Within the framework of the democracy that was proposed, each of them proposed the ideas of their dreams to the public, which the KGB could not trample or for which it did not have the right to imprison them. The democratization of socio-political life gave the possibility of creating various national democratic organizations and movements in Ukraine, which were beyond the control of the ruling Communist Party. The first mass organization was the Ukrainian Language Society. Its activists ardently believed that the Ukrainian language and the national culture were under serious threat and needed to be protected. This time brought to the surface what had been hidden behind seven seals. This is the work of the writers who emigrated to the West after the Second World War and was published there. But nobody in Ukraine knew about them. It was during these years, at the end of Gorbachev's perestroika in 1988 to 1991, that writers appeared who are currently studying in Ukrainian schools. They simply could not do anything to have a powerful influence on public consciousness. It was a discovery. The Memorial Society took on the leading role in the disclosure of Stalin's crimes. It was then that the history of the Holodomor of 1932 to 1933 was revealed to the world. This was the history of armed resistance of the Ukrainian insurrectionist army to the Stalinist regime and the truth about the Great Terror of 1937 to 1938, which exterminated almost the entire national elite. The first thought was that they were victims of Nazi terror. And later, when they started to dig up those cemeteries, they realized that these were mass graves of millions of people killed during the Soviet times. Even in the Soviet Union, this was a horrifying discovery for the public. This was a heinous crime that did not fit into the consciousness of Soviet people in those times. 
I remember this quite well. I was still a young girl. I was studying in a university. For us at the faculty it was an absolute shock. But you must understand that this was a historical faculty. At that time, during the years of perestroika, we studied what Stalin's terror was. We knew what it was, but the fact that it was imposed on personal feelings, the history of one's region, your family was opened on such a scale. Not all of us could handle this. One of our girls, who studied a year later after she personally participated in those digs, left the historical faculty and chose to turn to religion, which was a sphere that was totally different from what she was taught. The fact is that not everyone was able to survive it. І пішла в релігію абсолютно відійшовши від того, чого її навчали. Бо пережити це були спроможні далеко не всі. Of course, this has awakened the nation. People continued to unite in various kinds of national democratic organizations, the activities of which were directed towards the further development of democracy in the country. The most popular and influential social-political organization was the Ruch. At the time of the inauguration of the Constituent Assembly, which was held in Kyiv in September 1989, Ruch had already 280,000 members. <laughs> In fact, Ruch grew out of the established society for the protection of the Ukrainian language. And then this society grew into the people's Ruch already as a political force. This is also a natural process. Ruch defended the sovereignty of Ukraine, the revival of the Ukrainian language and culture and touched on environmental issues. This pertained to the consequences of the Chernobyl disaster in 1986. The members of Ruch also advocated the democratization of political, economic and social systems. With these slogans, the democratic forces of Ukraine went to the elections to the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine, which were held in March 1990. As a result, then members of Ruch achieved very high results. They garnered many votes of Kyiv residents. But most of the voters were in the western Ukraine. It is worth noting that former Ukrainian political prisoners were elected to the Ukrainian parliament. Levko Lukyanenko, Vyacheslav Chernovil, Bogdan and Mikhailo Horin, Irina Kalinets and others, having united in the Narodna Rada, People's Council. Democratic forces gained 125 seats in the parliament, although the communists far outnumbered their rivals. They first had to face legal opposition in the Verhoevna Rada, and they were clearly puzzled. Owing to the confusion of their opponents, the Narodna Rada gained a significant advantage in the parliament when, on its initiative, on July 16, 1990, the Verhoevna Rada of Ukraine adopted the Declaration on the State Sovereignty of Ukraine. We're talking about the confrontation between Moscow and Kyiv during perestroika, then it's realistically loomed in 1990, when Ukraine, and after it the other republics of the Soviet Union, decided on sovereignty. And from that moment on, seeing support for his actions in Ukrainian society, seeing that the Soviet regime is weakening, the Ukrainian party committee gradually went step by step along the path of no return, with the aim of gaining the state in independence of Ukraine. That which Ukrainian poet and public figure Ivan Bahrani predicted back in the distant 1940s actually happened. Namely, he said the Soviet Union will crumble from within. And the whole unbearable Ukrainian truth lies in the words of Bahrani in a totalitarian empire. What the Soviet Union is today, changes will come from within and they will be made by those who are in power. They need time to understand that there is no other way to live in the world until such an empire falls. And that's exactly what happened. Moscow, sensing that it was losing power over the republics of the Soviet Union, proposed a treaty on the basis of which a new constitution of the USSR would be drafted. In response to this, in early October 1990, mass protests began in Kyiv. Young people, they were mostly students, came to the nation's capital from all over Ukraine. This protest was called the Revolution on Granite, in addition to preventing the signing of a new Union Treaty. 
The youth demanded the guarantee of military service of young Ukrainians exclusively on the territory of Ukraine, the nationalization of the property of the Communist Party and the Komsomol, Communist Union of Youth. The student hunger strike in the autumn of 1990 was important because public support was actually mobilized around it. Not many of the activists actually went on this hunger strike, but this event was known all over Ukraine. It was an event that resonated in a significant part of society and in the end gave the intended result, namely the resignation of the government. Certain positive developments have taken place at the international level. From generation to generation, the world has heard little of Ukraine and Ukrainians. However, when it became obvious that the USSR would collapse, the desire of its second largest republic, which by its size and population was equal to most European countries, aroused growing interest. Evidence of this in particular was the official visit of US President George Bush to Kiev in July 1991. While in Kiev, George Bush Sr. gave a speech in the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine, in which he basically called for the preservation of the Soviet Union. This was later called Chicken Kiev. In fact, this speech was discordant with what was actually happening in reality. Indeed, the Americans placed their stakes on the wrong horse. They bet on Gorbachev, hoping that he would continue the reforms and continue nuclear disarmament. And they missed the nuance that a very powerful force in Ukrainian society that was a burning passion and fire of love for their country had come to the fore. The Americans listened very attentively to their special services, to the CIA, who said that in the mid-1980s Ukraine was almost dead, that Ukraine is no longer there, that Ukraine is completely dissolved, and they just overlooked this fact. Meanwhile, the crisis was brewing in Moscow. On August 19, 1991, there was an attempt of a coup d'etat there. Its initiators, representatives of the highest state leadership of the USSR, said that in connection with the alleged illness of the USSR president Mikhail Gorbachev, the State Committee of Emergency Situations, or SCES, would take over the rule of the country. The committee announced the introduction of a state of emergency for six months in certain regions of the USSR. The activities of all political parties were suspended, except for the Communist Party, non-government organizations and democratic movements. Rallies, demonstrations and strikes were prohibited. Mass media were strictly censored and newspapers were suspended, except for those few that were loyal to the State Committee of Emergency Situations. In this emergencies committee, people were not very talented. Raised by the Soviet system, their hands trembled during the announcement of these manifestos, which was very significant for all people who were glued to the television. They saw that these politicians were people who were afraid of themselves. And besides that, the collapse of the Soviet system was so obvious that it was virtually impossible to put the system back together using a weapon. In other words, it was a real convulsion. If the reaction of the leaders of the Ukrainian Republic to the events in Moscow was generally restrained, then the opposition forces took a principled position from the beginning of the insurrection, realizing the threat that the victory of the emergency committee posed for Ukraine. On August 19, 1991, the People's Ruch of Ukraine urged compatriots not to submit to the will of the rebels, to create structures of active resistance and to start an all-Ukrainian strike. On August 20, the People's Deputies of Ukraine from opposition forces condemned the coup d'etat and called for the support of the newly elected leadership of Russia in opposition to it. The absolute majority of society preserved the memory of any violations of their rights in the Soviet Union, or the rights of their relatives, or about some deep suffering and so on. And all the mass of people understood that it was necessary to take a step forward. Ukraine basically gathered all its forces and at the right moment of the largest collapse of the empire boldly declared its independence. On August 24, 1991, an extraordinary session of the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine convened at which the independence of the country was almost unanimously proclaimed. In support of the act of proclamation of independence, the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine decided to hold a Republican referendum on December 1, 1991, 
it was necessary to neutralize the political speculation of opponents of Ukrainian independence, especially in the eastern and southern regions of the Republic, who claimed that the people allegedly did not support the act of independence. Of the nearly 38 million citizens who were included in the secret ballot, 84.2% participated in it. Of this, 90.2% of voters responded positively to the proclamation of Ukraine's independence, including in Crimea and the Donbass region. According to the results of the referendum, no one could doubt that Ukrainians won their own independent state. After a long period of the absence of statehood, the Ukrainian people received a unique chance to turn Ukraine into a free, democratic state that would eventually become an equal partner of the international community.